I'd say trust asking your CMO to open the event and tell him it's an e-commerce event in New York and you come up with a mix of Hamilton, <laughs> a rap song, and e-commerce chief digital officers. That's what you get when you do that. But it's a brilliant version of it, at least. Um, thank you all for being here. This is exciting to be live again um, two, two and a half years after we did this, probably, uh, when, when COVID began to hit. As e-commerce leaders, we have a tremendous number of e-commerce leaders over here. We know it's an amazingly important, useful, and powerful business to go D to C. But a lot of us also think about how complex it is as a business to effectively run it. You know, going from thinking about it from a profitability perspective all the way to a growth perspective. And most e-commerce businesses are struggling between a rock and a hard place. Um, the rock, if you want to call it that, is uh, customer acquisition. You're spending a tax, if you will, between Google and Facebook. Um, and and it's, it's not a cheap amount of money being put into that, but your acquisition costs to bring in a new customer have soared. When you look at what you're sp spending with Facebook today, the amount of money that goes into it has gone up probably 20, 30 times. And with what Apple has been doing in the business today, which is taking out certain amounts of visibility, um, the attribution is down 30 to 50%, which makes it even harder to figure out where you're spending the right dollars. And sometimes you're spending a lot more to acquire these customers, and you're getting worse results with that. From the other extreme of this whole thing, you have the fulfillment issues that are coming with the business. And that is the last mile delivery, getting containers from China. What used to cost $15, if you will, for a container is up at $300, $400. If you did $2,000, that's 20x that. It's an expensive profile that you have to build to effectively run a business. And so most e-commerce leaders, realizing you can't be the Amazon of the world most of the time, are focusing in solving the middle, which is how do you acquire customers and then find ways to really grow and make your business profitable in the middle. And that middle includes things like the site experience, it includes things like conversion. It includes things like checkout and payments. And that is where most of what e-commerce is really growing towards these days. So when you think about that, we thought it would be a very interesting panel to bring together the right folks to be able to talk about that. And we have two amazing speakers here today to do that. I'm going to introduce both of them and have them up on stage here in a second. Our first panelist is Kel Raman. Um, Indy mentioned him. He's the chief digital officer of Samsung. Prior to Samsung, he was the SVP at Amazon. He was the chief operating officer at uh, Groupon. And he's also worked uh, in, uh, as the CEO of drugstore.com, which was the first online drugstore to make it in the, in, in the industry. Um, outside of all of that, um, and growing his multi-billion dollar business, uh, D2C, the most interesting thing I like about what I had my conversation with Cal about was he's worked with two of the best founders in the world, Sam Walton, who's a direct boss, and Jeff Bezos at Amazon. So without further ado, let's have Cal come up on stage. Um, our next panelist is Nicole Jass, SVP of product at FIS. If you've ever looked at the payments world, the single largest player in the payments world today is FIS. And you probably know them from the concept of WorldPay, but the combination of the two has created a juggernaut in payments. Nicole runs all of the product that comes in the middle, from loyalty to checkout to data, integrity, identity, fraud, everything is within her profile. Outside of that, Nicole is a top 25 uh, women in fintech person. But what I've enjoyed the most in getting to know Nicole over time is prior to getting into the big company, she actually built her own company for eight years, running it from, the, from zero to one. Um, but more importantly, one of my close friends, Nicole, please come on stage. <laughs> I know I 
right. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Rajesh. All right, Cal. Um, go with question to start with you in the beginning. You built an amazing e-commerce business in digital commerce, all the way up from zero to multi-billions in less than four years. Um, outside of that, which is, that is great in itself, but the bigger achievement, if you will, is in the last 12 months, you doubled a multi-billion dollar e-commerce business while growing the operating expense by only f a few percentage points, like less than 10%. That's phenomenal. I don't think anyone in the industry in e-commerce has ever seen that. Talk a little bit about how you achieved that journey, especially focusing on the site experience and the, the journey in between. Thanks. Uh, first, thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to see people face to face without a mask. Some of us look better, some of us look worse. <laughs> <laughs> After two and a half years, and thanks Rajesh and India and the Signified team to have me here. Um, the first biggest credit, let's uh, give it where it's due, is the Samsung brand. Yeah. Okay, it is the number five or number six brand in the world, and uh, we are known for innovative products, and, and it is a very, very innovative company when it comes to products. So make sure that let's just give the credit there. And despite Samsung being the, one of the best brands in the world, our traffic actually went down year over year. Okay, okay and uh, uh, traffic goes down, cost of acquisition goes up. And how do you grow your business, right? And uh, there are only two ways to do it. One is the best customer acquisition is customer retention. And the customer retention comes from innovations like what, uh, not, you know, Signified helped us with uh, fraud protection because you don't want to hold up a customer who's a good customer saying that, hey, I can't ship things to you. So that kind of work we have done with Signified, especially on a high ASP product like what we sell, our ASP is greater than $400, $500. So you don't want to upset a customer who's willing to give you $1,000 saying that you know, some address line doesn't match, uh, match to whatever we got. The improvement we made in our fraud reduction, uh, so you know, don't ask me for more MDR. Uh, you guys did a great job last year, and uh, our approval rates went up year over year because you built the history, we built the history. And the second most important thing is, you know, I kind of thinking about it while I was walking here. What did we do? Uh, you know, you know, I we stayed true to one of the statements Steve Jobs made in the commencement speech in 2005 at Stanford. We stayed hungry uh, and smart on the shopping cart. We know we can't control the traffic and the quality of the traffic or the cost of traffic to a great extent, but we stayed focused on controlling the controllable and focusing the input. So you could say the mantra, we stayed hungry and smart on shopping cart conversion. That's what helped us. It's a very good point. And maybe just one more thing you mentioned which stuck in my mind in that whole discussion was the idea of maximizing the cart in a way that actually added value so that you could get additional products. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Very yeah, quickly. so, you know, we, we all know about return on ad spend, ROI on marketing and so on and so forth. I basically, 2020, at the end of the pandemic, I basically decided that that's an important metric, output metric we should look at, but we should kind of keep an eye, but our focus should be on a different metric. We coined a new metric. If you use it, you need to pay me trademark. <laughs> Uh, I call it return on shopping cart. Uh, return on shopping cart is I know when people are putting the products from PDP to the cart. From that point onwards, what is my, con what is my improvement in conversion? And what are the various reasons? It could be fraud, it could be payment innovations, it could be CEJ adjustments, it could be putting uh, e-promoters or customer service in the middle of it. And the return on shopping cart metric, which became our mantra in 2021, literally dub, more than doubled when the traffic went down 20%. And lots of partners helped, lots of, uh, you know, we had a great team. You know, I, I'm just here talking for my team. I can't take credit for any of that. I just told them this is where we need to focus. And we innovated on payment methods, customer experience journeys, and reducing fraud, which, which you played probably the most important role. And the way you helped us in reducing returns 
because of the way you approved the right people, made our net revenue uh, uh, bigger. Because the demand revenue and net revenue, there is always a 10% difference. People get shocked at the end of every month, and January p and looks crappy for everybody after Q4. We were able to integrate all of them together by focusing on that one uh, metric, which is called return on shopping cart. Awesome. Nicole, um, speaking of that, you sit on a wide array of products across the FIS portfolio. Uh, conversion is a big aspect of that for you. you, you your suite of products are focused on driving higher conversions. E-commerce has been around for 25 years. Payments has been around for a large portion of that. When you think about it, it hasn't been a solved problem yet. Why do you think that is? Yeah. I think because I just got the products about a year ago. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but in all honesty, when, uh, when FIS acquired WorldPay, a big part of the thesis was you take a million plus merchant locations and 85% of the banks uh, in the US who work with FIS, and what can we do with the data in the middle, right? I think the answer is a lot about connecting the dots. The dots are out there. Um, as an example of something that we're doing, we're working with uh, on our trusted mid program. If you're, if you're not familiar with that, essentially working with a company like Netflix. I've been a customer of Netflix for three plus years. They hit my same card every month. And Netflix, through those recurring transactions, is still seeing too many declines that happen with these good customers who they know that they should be um, approving. And so what they've done is, is they essentially create this, this trusted mid and these preferred customers and we route them to our issuers through this trusted mid and actually relax some of the authorization parameters for those trusted customers. And I was on a call with a bank explaining this to them and, and we said, hey, one of those parameters is, is um, known fraud or suspected fraud on a card. And they're like, why would I approve suspected fraud on a card? And if I'm running around in New York, I lose or my, my MasterCard gets stolen, I, don't, I still want my Netflix, right? And so, <laughs> Without that context, and so those are some of the dots to connect, right? That we can see on the merchant side that this is a good and known customer. Netflix says, hey, if this comes back as a chargeback, I got it, right? So nothing on you, bank. And in, and in return, a good customer gets their transaction. And someone who's going through a lot with my MasterCard stolen still gets to watch my Netflix. And so those are some of the dots that, you know, we're just getting started. We're starting to put our merchant fraud scores into our issuer fraud. So we're kind of the bad guy sometimes. We're, we are the, the fraud solution. We have, um, we, we have a great relationship with FICO and we use the Falcon solution, but we are the ones on the issuing side declining some of these transactions. And so when we can marry up the guys on the, the merchant side and my checkout team who are doing everything they can to create um, authorization rates and have them sit down with our fraud team on the banking side, you know, magic happens because we can really talk through what are these decline rates, you know, what, is good, what, are, what are really these good transactions where we can connect some of these dots and make sure the good gets through and not just stop the bad? Well, so one of the things I think in, in the payments world, just because there's so many cool and sexy sort of payment companies that are out there, people forget that the power of FIS, if you will, is the combination of not just the merchant network, but the 3,000 plus issuers that are in your network that you can actually combine the decision making not just at the merchant level but down to the issuing level. And that power is something that never gets talked about in the, in the world as much. But I don't know if you wanted to say anything to that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that's precisely it, right? And that's, um, that's kind of my job. My, my job and my team's job is to try to unlock that, right? And to, and to look across these, these transactions that we see on both sides and the intelligence that we can get from both sides. Yeah to really make sure that we're making the right decision for all of our customers. But uh, absolutely, I mean, our issuers, they want that approval too, because they don't want that MasterCard to fall in the wallet. Yeah. They want to make sure that it's the card that's getting loaded to card on file and the recurring payments. And so yeah. it's a win for all of us. Um, it's just a matter of, of making the, the dots connect. Yeah. Kel, uh, your vantage point as a chief digital officer is, is a full PNL. You look at it end to end. And one of the things Nicole mentioned is conversion. When you looked at it from a conversion perspective and you wanted to modernize payments a little bit to, to kind of holistically look at it, you saw, as you mentioned, somewhere between a 5 to 15% higher conversion rate in, in the business. Most e-commerce leaders here are thinking about it, but it's not the first thing they think about to say, look, let's go at this stack because we can drive if I have to drive growth this year of 5 to 10%, this is an easy way for me to do it while continuing to build for scale. Why do you think people don't think about that first? 
Because, you know, conventional wisdom is uh, always, uh, you know, is common sense, you know, common sense being not common, right? And uh, so when, when your business is going down or not growing, immediately you say it's a marketing problem and you, you really want to go spend money in marketing and then go beat up your marketing team or agency to get your keywords right and do the right marketing message, communication message, and whether it's Google or uh, with affiliates or go pay money to uh, any of these N things you got like Facebook and Instagram. But people forget a fundamental fact. Uh, you know, we, we, you need, we need to look at the forest from the trees, right? You know, average conversion is between one to say 7%. That's one way to look at it. That's why the ROA is in marketing today is, you know, one to two, two times. Uh, but return on ad spend for a dollar of spend, you get $2, $2 of revenue. That means you are getting in a 10% net operating margin, you are getting 20 cents back. So the real meat of the problem is after you get the traffic. And after you get the traffic, people sit there and say 28% of people fall off PDP, 42% of people go to checkout, 28% of them fall off at payment method. Okay, great. These are all like our oh, you know, numbers change here and there, and people will say I've done heat map study, I've done this, so on and so forth. It's it's a, again this is conventional wisdom right there. So this is where you know like uh, actually we used uh, some of your data and we built our own AI models. We figured out that there are certain consumers uh, are at a different phase of the purchase journey, right? As we go higher in ASP, we are not in selling you know in, impulse buys, right? So. There are five stages of customer experience. There is awareness, consideration to purchase, intent to purchase, and then the purchase, and then the loyal, loyal customer are going to do repeat purchase to whom you can upsell or cross sell. It is super important for you to understand your traffic is not new visitor and repeat visitor, new customer and existing customer. You need to understand whether it's new or repeat, which stage of the purchase journey they are in. And at each one of the purchase stages of the purchase journey, you, f you figure out that somebody aspired to buy the product, the payment method would make a big difference. So people, not everybody can shell out uh, $1,000 for a phone. Uh, probably they want to use 24-month financing. Some people would want 12-month financing. Some people would want, you know, we, we use our firm, which is a great product also, uh, on uh, buy now, pay later. We launched a new program called try now, pay later using a firm. And we use TD Bank for our financing. We take PayPal. Within PayPal, we introduce crypto. And you know, everybody thought, you know, why, why do you care about crypto? And I said, like, it's not about uh, me getting a transaction right now. It's about me telling somebody that there are many ways you can buy in Samsung.com. And that became a cool marketing thing more than a transaction thing. So I think we, you, there is only commerce or retail is product, price, promotion, and place. And places, uh, people forget the place. People spend so much time on place in brick and mortar retail. If you are selling in a brick and mortar store or a Best Buy anywhere, you're going to say, I want my display to be right. I want, my, I want this to be in this corner. I want these products to be sitting together to facilitate contiguous purchases. But that place in e-commerce is your shopping cart. And that is where you need to focus. Use the place to, to talk about price and promotion and payment method. Because the product is already done, because it's already in the shopping cart. So I said convert the four piece of retail into four piece of e-commerce, which is the place is shopping cart. Talk about your promotion. And don't talk about your product. Talk about your payment method. Because the payment method is as important as you go in higher ASP. And how do you get higher approval? That's where the data-centric approach, uh, data-centric approach is super important. That's where we use, you know, you give us approval, we have the raw transaction data, and we know exactly who bought before. We know exactly how they bought before. So we know they are going to be fine. So we literally change the recommendation of payment method to somebody based on who they are real time as they go from a shopping cart to payment. So think of it this way, you know, like, the place is shopping cart. I, I keep saying the same thing. Focus on this is just going to get worse. The cost of customer acquisition is going to go higher. And logistics problems are not going to get solved. The world is pivoting around just in case, just in time to just in case. And that logistics change will take another three to five years. So 
you are stuck with these two problems. Now focus on controlling the controllable. Like we are mentioning Steve a lot. I started with stay foolish and stay hungry. She started with connecting the dots. 2005 commencement speak has got both. To be focused on the shopping cart, make sure that you let everybody through without stopping anybody. Make sure that you innovate a lot on payments. And the cop place, you need to focus maniacally is shopping cart. Very interesting. And part of what you're talking about is also just the modernization of um, the way people should think about the whole thing end to end. One of the things, Nicole, that we're going to talk about, Jordan McKee is here from 451 Research, and he's going to be talking a little bit about payments modernization and what that means to how important it is to retailers going forward. In your vantage point at FIS, how do you think about payments modernization and what that actually means from a strategic perspective? Yeah, no, great question. I think um, two things. I would say, you know, one is protect the data at all costs and, and the integrity of the data. So we're seeing lots of opportunity for disintermediation um, and, and just this desire to make sure whether you tokenize, whether you're using a par value, you know, whatever your kind of value you're tagging to a customer, that you're essentially creating something persistent, right? So that you can see them across your different shopping journeys, online, in-store, um, wherever they are, so that there's persistence in the data. And I would say, um, you know, the second one is work with your payments partner. I mean, we, we have, we've built products together. Those are some of my most fun conversations when we're actually talking to some of our customers. Um, one of our big customers um, has this new concept of partner love. And, and so we're on a call just talking about what's keeping her up at night. You know, what is she thinking about? She's thinking about disintermediation. She's thinking about who can turn off a subscription. She wants it to be her, right, on her site so she has a chance to save them and not, um, not a third party. And they're thinking about wallets. And so I think, you know, partnering with your payments, there's a lot of magic that happens when, um, when you can work together and you're not just kind of tossing things over the fence. Yeah, and when, when you look at it, in general about the direction you're seeing with a lot of the larger customers you work with. You know, you talk about Netflix, you talk about Google. Is this a driving force you're seeing coming from the, the merchants themselves to kind of push the boundaries? Or do you feel like there's a lot of push upwards where you, you in, in, in sort of the payments world is taking things with ideas into the, the merchant side? Which, which side is it? Is it the push or the pull? It's a great question. I think. Um in all fairness, I think it's our merchants. I mean, they, they're really pushing. A lot of them are, um, a lot of them, they're not scared of fraud, right? They're, they're almost saying, I want more fraud because I want to make sure that I'm not stopping my good customers. Yeah. They don't really want more fraud. But they want to make sure that they're not, the false positives, they understand. I think you guys had some stats, right? The fear of fraud is worse than, uh, I like that. It wasn't a stat, it was a statement. But I think our, some of those big customers, they're really trying to push the boundaries and say, hey, I want to make sure that I don't stop a good experience from happening. Yeah. Um, they've also got a lot of payment optimization expertise. And so what they're really pushing us to do is, is um, give them tools, transparency, help them show like, okay, if we're gonna tokenize something and then route something and then look for an account update or like, let's check the sequencing of those different things and make sure that it's fully optimized. So they're jumping in the, jumping in the car with us and really trying to move the levers and, and optimize those payments. Yeah. Cal, you touched on return on shopping cart earlier, and I want to go deeper on that. But as a connection to it, when we think of payments modernization, you are a good representation of one of those big e-commerce giants that pushed into modernization from that. So what is, when you think of it at, from a Samsung perspective, what was payments modernization, especially when it ties back to the idea of return on shopping cart. And, and elaborate, we'd love to hear that return on shopping cart theme, because I do think that is a very interesting concept you're bringing to the table. I think the payments modernization is going to be mandatory. Uh, you, you know, it is very important for high ASP products for sure, right? And uh, to me, you know, anything greater than $99 is a considered purchase. Not for you, Rajesh, you may be rich enough not to worry about it, but uh, I'm talking yeah. about normies, right? So. Uh, when, when you are in a business like that, uh, people, the, the general consumer behavior today, which is just going to get even more in that line, people want to pay for the experience and they want to pay what they want to pay. Yeah. 
that's why you know subscription services are booming you know like people are sitting there and saying i'll pay only 9.99 11.99 for netflix to 10 dollars a month for prime but they don't understand that they are actually pay, paying 130 dollars to amazon but the way it is done is it's 10 12 dollars a month 10 dollars a month whatever it is so what that means is people are going to need more options on how they want to have what they want to have but they want to have it in the way they want to have because every young person i am not young and I, my daughter is 28 years old so uh, you know when i talk to her uh, she has got her own budget she's basically say i want to allocate so much monthly for this 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 and when she wants to buy the new samsung phone or iphone which normally dad gets for her <laughs> but let's talk about something else uh, she's literally saying i'm going to sp i can afford to spend 120 dollars a month on this one so what that indirectly means you work backwards from customer experience what that means is they want to have they want to have the luxury experience, but they want to pay it like a subscription. And it is very common sense. Then what the, how do you sell luxury goods? People who want to have it and they want to pay it like a subscription. The only place where you innovate is payment. And the only place you can innovate wisely without losing money is making sure that you are giving that credit, line of credit to the right people and make sure that you know like you you kind of take it to the bleeding edge of approval rates right so we had i, I don't even remember i started with uh, 12 month financing uh, zero percent apr you can pay after six months 12 months became 24 on certain products 36 month financing 48 month financing buy now pay later try now pay later and uh, you know use uh, crypto use your uh, credit card miles you know, convert your credit card miles and your uh, air miles, okay, air, airline miles as a payment method. And then the other thing we are trying to do is how can we get Uber uh, store credits people have got? There are companies which are consolidating, you know, store credits, and hopefully one of these days you should do it because you are in the marketplace. You should create a signified uh, money uh, based on whether it is forward or reverse logistic, and that should become a common currency. And if you do that, this is where Web3 is going to change everything. And if, if you do all of that, the most important thing you need is uh, proof of personhood and proof of the wallet. And what, what is the meaning of uh, blockchain and Web3? That is proof of personhood and proof of the wallet, the other asset you have in the wallet. So the payment innovation we are seeing, I was just talking to Nicole this morning, the, whether you like it or not, if it doesn't get innovated fast, the consumers are going to let let you alone and there are few guys i'm confident working in some garage in bay area are working on this idea right now so that is going to be a very very necessary problem which needs to get solved and it will get solved at a rapid pace in the next 24 months because of the advent of web3 you, you touched on something that i just want to go deeper on but i thought it was very interesting the idea of at the high end of luxury, if you will, or the high end of dollar purchases, there's a concept of leasing. So like if I buy a car, I have the option to lease a car. When you go down to the, the recurring revenue business models that a lot of higher dollar value customers effectively where it's over, I don't know what number to pick on what side, let's say 250 or 500 in commerce don't have that lease model, if you will. What do you think, do you think that's something we'll see in the future? Absolutely, I, I think the fundamental reason why you don't see lease model in le anything less than cars, and I think hopefully my team, and this is my last week in Samsung, so I've given the strategy, I got bored after scaling the business uh, twice, <laughs> uh, 100%, six years is a long time. Uh, and that's the, how long I worked in Walmart and everywhere. So I love Samsung, okay? I'm a Sam, Samsung fan. I'm a life lover out of Samsung. The fundamental reason why you don't see leasing in anything less than, say, for example, car, is the MDR they put. So they effectively take the total value by the time you finish the leasing is to 1.75 to 2 times of the product. So if you want to buy something on $1,000, if you end up leasing, which means you, you lease it and you can return whenever you want. The actual money, if somebody is smart, all, all the customers are smart. They figure out why the hell I should pay 2x the product when I can do financing even if I'm going to pay APR. And there are certain companies which are working on it, and uh, we are working with one of them. 
But this is where I believe a clear data model on the customer's ability to pay back. And someone like you guys, Affirm, Klarna, somebody needs to come together to how do you create leasing which would not exceed 1.5x max of the value of the product while provide the flexibility to the consumer that I can lease a product, return it anytime. If I want, I can upgrade it anytime, which is a good thing for the merchant. And how do you handle the residual value and the MDR and the total cost to the customer is going to be another big change, which is going to be very important for, I would say, high ASP products. And I am confident um, I have trusted my team. You will see that launched in Q2 at Samsung.com. It's fascinating. It's a very interesting concept, and I, I don't think I don't think a lot of people have thought through that leases happen at cars. Why hasn't that come down to the next level? That, that is a very interesting concept. Nicole, uh, when, when you think of new offerings in, in the space about how these uh, payment modernizations work and you think about conversion rates, one of the the coolest things you're going to be launching here shortly, and I know it's still under wraps, is going to be FIS guaranteed payments. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that means to the business and what it's going to bring to the market? Yeah, absolutely. Raj is a little biased on it being the coolest product, but I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it really is the culmination of a partnership um, with, with Signified and FIS WorldPay. And you know, when we talk to customers, the top two pain points are one, higher approval rates. I need higher approval rates. And two, I don't have capital or prioritization to build or integrate anything, right? So it, it's a lot, it, when we talk to our customers, you know, it's hard to get on the backlog just like at our company and, and build something new. And so with guaranteed payments, it'll be integrated into our payment stack, right? And so we can literally, and we are talking to our customers about turning on higher approvals and guaranteeing higher approvals, which I believe is the first in the industry from a payments provider, right? To be able to go out to market and say, um, it's not, we're not selling a fraud solution in my opinion, we're selling higher approvals, right? And the freedom for those customers to go into new markets, try new things, try new programs, payments programs, um, without the fear of fraud. And so that's, we've, we've already been in the market, we're so excited, we've got some early customers. Um, our first customer who's on, on the platform, as you know, saw a 7% increase in approval rates which I think turned into $8 million of revenue for them. I mean, that, that's meaningful, that's top line. And to your point, they've worked so hard to get that customer into the shopping cart, you know, and this is just $8 million that wasn't thrown away. Um, it was good revenue that needed to get through. So we're, we're really excited to take that to our customers globally. Yeah. I, I know I'm biased because it is a <laughs> partnership between us, but I, I would definitely say it is the coolest thing because in payments in the industry today, there's absolutely no payment provider in the market that has come out with the ability to offer one plugin, which you get to your payments network in, and then you drive not only a guaranteed increase in auth rates, because they connect into the issuing side too, if you will, they're, they're able to influence the issuers to be able to say, you've got to approve this transaction, not turn it away, plus the ability to make sure you have no liability if that happens, because we're taking the full liability for it. That customer experience of not, the merchant experience is one thing which is super important. You get one plug in, you're done, you don't have to worry about it, but the customer experience of being able to convert more, not have to wait for the decision to happen, I think is the first in the industry that has ever been launched, and I, I, I do think that's gonna be a game changer. It, I, yeah, I think it's a huge game changer. We've, um, we, we have another, uh, a fraud product on market, and just a couple weeks ago, we had a customer who was having this, it's fallback fraud, where fraudsters are essentially taking a card, um, a, a stolen card, making a plastic out of it, sticking it into a register at point of sale, and because it doesn't work, they go to a fallback. And when it's a fallback at point of sale, the merchant's liable. And they were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a day, and we said, do you want us to turn on our fraud product? And it wasn't like, hey, do you want to integrate to something, and then like in three months, we could solve this for you. It was, do you want us to turn it on? And so that's one of, I think, the core propositions for guaranteed payments is, do you want us to just like increase your approval rates? That's right, that's right. Um, both of you are sitting in such good vantage points that you always have to think about what makes you not sleep at night. Um, and there's so many things. I'm sure your kids wake you up and that's not an area you want me to talk about. But um, Cal, maybe to start with you, if, if you look at the future and you say, the pain points you wake up to and say, these are worrisome for me because it could disrupt my business. It, 
it may not be with the perfect theme of everything we talked about, but if you bring it back into the zone, what are some of those things that you worry about and what do you think is the future of why, where, where things are going? So, uh, you know, I'm a movie, Indian movie fan, and there's a recent movie called RRR uh, released. It's a great movie. You guys should go see it. And uh, uh, I worry about two R's. Uh, first one is return on shopping cart. Uh, because of the squeeze you are going to get from top of the funnel spend, and uh, you know, like the issues you are going to have with logistics, which are not going to get solved. So two R's, return on shopping cart. The second one is returns from customers. As you know, the pandemic evolves, you know, like uh, it's going to be up and down. Online shopping is going to increase, whether you like it or not. It's going to be direct to consumer. It could be buy online, pick up in store, or buy online, return in store. The returns are going to increase. So if you don't focus on those two things in a data-centric way, uh, Either you are going to be in trouble for top line, or you are going to be in trouble for bottom line, uh, or you know the, the the return customer return part is actually not just bottom line, because you know like if you look at any data, you know like uh, approximately, especially in high ASP, 10% of your orders get returned, literally 10% of your orders get cancelled, and if you don't give, on an average, it takes an e-commerce company to give returns in 10 to 14 days after they receive the product and triage it. Every time you give a bad experience to a customer on return, your ability to retain that customer goes down by a factor of 50%. So it's actually a top line improver, lifetime value improver, customer retention improver, and it's extremely friction filled and time consuming. So either watch RRR or worry about two hours. Return on shopping cart and customer returns. Maybe just to, to touch on the returns piece, um, the pain point that you reflected is, is CLTV, just the customer lifetime value that you want to drive. And hopefully, if you return and create the experience that is beautiful, you get people to buy instantly. The other piece you touched on is getting cash back instantly. And I, th I think that's a fascinating point, because when you look at maybe you said, I'm rich, but when you look at you, you probably don't care of how much your credit card statement looks like. But um, when you look at a traditional... I let Vigie do it, my <laughs> wife. So. Okay. But, but when you think about the average person out there that probably has a $2,000 credit limit and they buy a Samsung phone for $1,000, you've locked their credit now for only 1000 And if you have to wait 14 days on a return where somebody has to ship it back you have to triage it, open it up, detect whether it's, the, it's a brick or is it a phone, is it the right product, have they broken it, is it a number, have they shipped you a different phone? And then you say, okay, now I'm gonna refund it back to you, and then it takes three to four days to get the money back. Somebody is out for a month, perhaps, with no credit back on their account, and so now they're operating on a on $1,000 within their account. That, how, do you see that as being a super big pain point? I, I, I think that's good, that, let me put it this way. I mean, nobody can out Amazon Amazon because as part of Amazon, I know Amazon. So, but uh, anybody can create an Amazon-like experience with a differentiation. So what is the most important thing in high ASP or even any ASP product, when you want to return, you want to return and get your money back in 24 to 48 hours. And the merchant gets the money back uh, in their p &L, whether it's at 100% or 75 cents on a dollar, and they also want to get it in their PNL before they close the month or the close the quarter. In between is the heavy lifting of dirty fingernail business, and you should go solve it. Uh, it is, uh, because it is truly tied to, uh, you know, approving a purchase. To me, forward logistics is very similar to reverse logistics. Everybody gets excited about uh, traffic conversion order, which is all forward logistics. But you don't know the fact that the money is made in the reverse logistics or lost in the reverse logistics. So if, if we can have a solution which is Amazon-like, where the consumers can easily give their return somewhere without doing much work, and if they get their money back in 24 to 48 hours, uh, that is going to happen. It has to happen. The reason it's going to happen is the market is going to force somebody to do it. As online business goes up, BOPIS will go up. People will get excited about BOPIS. Then you are going to sit there and worry about Boris. 
right? <laughs> I'm not talking about the, the UK Prime Minister. I'm not a big fan of him either. Uh, but it, it is an inevitable problem which needs to get solved. Got it. Yeah. Nicole, l last question to you. We can go on all, all day on this topic, I'm sure. But just last question to you. When you think about the same problem on the payment side, what keeps you up at night? And what do you see as the future innovations that's yeah. going to come to, to counter that? So besides my kids and my dogs, um, <laughs> I think the biggest thing in payments is, um, I mean, it's no secret, payments is getting commoditized, right? We're, we're, we're like, the payments piece is like the utility company, where the electricity that you just expect to come to your house. Um, we have the opportunity to do what we're doing with, like, with guaranteed payments to help make revenue, right? And where we can actually attach ourselves to revenue and top line growth, that's where our company has, a, has the opportunity for exponential growth. So that's what keeps me up at night is how do we very quickly you know, transform a majority of our revenue that we drive at WorldPay to be part of that top line growth. You know, we have loyalty programs, we have pay with points, we see amazing conversion there, um, that trusted bid program. So where we can show that we can drive customer acquisition or we can help drive that revenue growth, it's, it's a race in, in my mind, right? Because um, because we know that the payments piece itself is becoming utility. Yeah, it's well said, and, and so sort of bringing it back to the, the the way we set the stage for this discussion, it is in the middle where most of the revenue is going to come because you've got both the bookends sort of taken care of. And I think the the point you made is effective that in the middle, most retailers are kind of looking at two things. One is how do I get existing customers to spend more with me? What are the different things I can do? And then the second thing is, how do I not turn away good people? And that combination of two things tied with what you said on the back end of the whole thing, which is I want to drive customer lifetime value, but I also don't want to start the, the, the month where I got $100 that came in, and now I have to subtract things from my P&L. So I'm taking out, OK, fraud is 1% of $100, so I've lost 100 from that. I then lost my returns piece because someone returned it, so I have to take this much out. So when you look at your whole cohort, you're saying, okay, I made a million, but I've taken out 200,000 for this, I've taken out 100,000 for this, and you're at the end of the day adding in your profit, like you said, if you're only a 20% profit, your, your, your numbers are very different. And how can you maximize each element of that is effectively uh, the competition. So the, the other point, you know, I'm confident all of you look at your data. If you make the return process friction-free and fast, more than 30 to 50 percent of the people will come back and make a purchase within the first seven days. If you make your cancellation process friction-free and fast, most of the people will come back and buy from you again in the first seven days. And your lifetime value goes up, you get the business back. So don't misunderstand the seriousness of a friction-free return process and friction-free cancellation process. Because if you do it right, do right by the customer, it's like the karma in the world, right? You think good, do good, good will come to you. Uh, so the returns and the cancellation after the forward approval is done is actually as important. In high ASP, it's literally 20% of your business. So it's actually 20% of top line if you do it right, or you go spend $200 million with Facebook and Google to get the same damn top line, which is going to make you profitable to yours, you have to work hard. Yeah. Well said. Well, we're at time. I just wanted to say thank you both. I think this was a fascinating conversation. We went down a lot of different topics, but appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.